thank you very much for joining us for the third part of the, this session. Um, and what's going to happen here is the opportunity to hear from the people that really matter, which of course are the artists. We're very fortunate to have our artists here today. Danielle Tediger, we have um, Helen O'Leary, we have Dan Copperwhite, and we have Aaron Lawler here. And myself and Jason are here to sort of keep a conversation going, but I actually don't think we'll have much work to do somehow. <laughs> I, I don't think that. The other thing what we're going to do, of course, is we would invite comments and invite questions from the audience. We want to see this as an interactive um, event, uh, um, opportunity to talk. Um, what I would ask my colleagues to do here is that we have some of the images that the artists have been working on, including installations that are not, that uh, from other venues where they've exhibited. So we can flick back and forth through some of the images as well. That's part of my job and my role here today. So um, what I would uh, like to do is to begin. So what we're going to have talk, as I say, questions, comments. But we'd like to begin by asking Jason, I suppose, some of your thoughts uh, in terms of the exhibition and ask the quest questions, comments that you'd like to bring to start this discussion off. Yeah, well, thanks. I, I think a great first question for, for all of the artists might be, to what degree has your relationship to Ireland informed your relationship to abstraction? Yes. OK, so on, on that gentle question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, very well, easy. Starting off. <laughs> I know, on the first one. <laughs> Go for it, Daniel. Um, so first, I just want to say, um, what a, it's a great full house, and thank you for coming yes. on this Irish weather. And you know, a lot of uh, really familiar faces out there. So you know, I would say you know, at first glance, um, you you know, I you know, obviously I'm part of the um, you know diaspora here, and you would think maybe perhaps there's not a relationship. And we were actually at a dinner last night chatting about this, and you know, my work, my my grandparents came here um, from Kerry to to the Bronx, and they were part of um, part of the union trades, my father was too, they were all union steam fitters, and that was a, a union, very Irish trade, so the Irish would sponsor one another. And so I would go on those jobs in the Bronx in the 70s and 80s, it was what you could do in the 70s in New York, and I, you know, I would draw all morning with my uncles, and you know, most of those guys on those jobs were Irish, or they were children of Irish. So I grew up drawing, drafting, engineering plans, plumbing plans, and things like that. So um, of course my work is very informed by modernism and abstraction, but there's a really very, very direct link for me into an Irish trade in drawing. Would, would you characterize that as a kind of like working class kind of background that maybe also has an aesthetics to it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it was you know, absolutely working class, but there was, um, I mean, it's really where I learned the whole idea of craft, you know, before I went to school, because those, you know, those steam vetters were, be they beautifully welded, they were beautiful drawings, there was, um, you know, there was just a sense in aesthetics that mm -hmm. I learned. So, yeah, I mean, of course, I learned that later in art school, but um, it's really, really at the heart of my work still. And, and that relates as well then to making this idea of process. Absolutely. I mean, I went to art school. I thought I'd be a steam fitter, frankly. And then I realized probably around 13, wow, I'm, you know, not, there's very, very few women steam fitters. Although we did talk about flash dance yes, last night. Yes, we did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, still there's very few. It's like one of the trades that is like the least, um, has the least women in it. Um, but that idea, you know, I went because I knew how to draw, I knew how to, to weld actually from my family and I still do yeah. those things. So. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. I think we'll, we'll follow through. Um, How would you like to? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I farmed till I was 19 with my sister. The pair of us ran a farm and it was very physical. It was um, kind of a beautiful, hard life in many ways and it was beautiful in another. And mm. I learned things. I learned how to mark mm. animals. I learned mm. how to, um, the pattern of work. The pattern of work was really important to me. And materiality, which is still very much a part of my work, you know, just, just working with soils, working with plants, working with um, animal matter. Um, I still use rabbit and glue. Um, mm. I'm still a kind of straying vegetarian. Um, <laughs> so that kind of land and that kind of rigor of work and painting is a verb and 
labor as a verb. It's, it's mm. kind of intermeshed with my practice. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things I noticed, if you don't mind, I put up her sticks. Oh. I, we mm. love sticks. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say also what I noticed about the materials, and you talk about this, is making and doing, but using everything and reusing. I mean, yeah. it's the standard thing that most... I Irish throw away nothing. Of time. Exactly, you throw away nothing. Do you not? I don't. I, <laughs> I, I reconstitute the sawdust. You know, I, I mould the sawdust. There's nothing thrown away. Like all these colours here yeah. are from, they're from pigments and soils from various parts of the homes that I have, hmm. be it in Ireland or be it in central Pens- Carbon County, Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm working with this notion of home, mm-hmm. be it in Ireland or in Leitrim or in... Um, Pennsylvania. So, so it sounds like there's also a sense of place that yes, is now kind of running much. throughout this in terms of materials, in terms of the way that one works. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. And even the, the linen on that was grown in a certain place, like a poultice. It would kind of the linen, the flax would, to my mind, inhale the trouble of that land. Huh. So it's within the cloth of the material. Uh, do you take materials from, uh, there's nobody listening here from Excel's or whatever, but do you take materials from <laughs> Ireland and bring it to here? It could happen. <laughs> it could happen. And do you do vice versa? <laughs> because I think that's a very interesting idea. There's nothing that thrills me more when I get my bag in Dublin or here and it's got that little certificate that somebody's looked in it. And I would love to see their face when they open. <laughs> but those tangible links, this literally tangible links. Which little, are just yeah, little, little, little bags of crushed eggshells and yeah, mm. stuff like that. And, and because you're vegetarian, there's no sausages. I, I said I was a string. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> which is great, it's part of the story. Sorry, there's Diana. rabbit skin <laughs> glue. Exactly. exactly. Sorry, Diana, would you like to take Jason's question? Um, so, yeah, so I suppose we all come from very different perspectives on this, but I grew up in the west of Ireland and grew up in a family where um, physics and chemistry were kind of very prevalent things. Like my father was a physics teacher, my uncle was a physicist. So as a way of kind of, I don't know, um, looking and quantifying the world in a, in a very abstract way, it was kind of normalised very early on, particularly about things to do with the light spectrum. And it was kind of like an antidote to the overwhelming kind of Catholicism that mm-hmm. I also feel like I grew up with in Limerick, you know. And so that's kind of where I come from. And I suppose then I kind of think about the way I paint as ha- um, creating kind of a notational system that looks at the a way of quantifying the unseen world. So it's like where the where the unseen and the physics meets metaphysics always really interested me. You know, mm. that kind of... So that's a very lo- convoluted way of putting something, but that's kind of where my interest mm. in it came. And also I went to art college in Limerick and um, was thought by people who were very interested in Hans Hoffman. Um, and so I had that idea about the plasticity of paint and the, the surface and the push and pull very early on, but it completely suited the other interests I had as well. So it's kind of like a mishmash of all those things. But in context of the Irishness, that's very interesting. Mm. Mm. Isn't it very interesting that in some ways that you that left and you that are, you know, that you're coming, you're more tangibly linked to the sort of the working that you would associate or to the Irish story. Do you understand me? Yeah. So where do you think, like, you fit in that Irish story as such? Because that's something I find very interesting for our generation, Mm. that we find ourselves moving away from those traditional links to land, Mm. those traditional links to older farming methods, whatever. You know, a lot of my friends were very quick to let that go. I suppose I didn't grow up on a farm. You see, that's it. Yeah, so, but, but my dad's family were were, um, were from a farm, and my mother's family would have been less so. My mother's family would have been kind of a slightly English, like, descended from English people, middle class, merchant kind of people. Mm. So I had a slightly mixed kind of um, reality as well mm. because of that. But also, like, when, you know, the landscape, I love being in the landscape in the west of Ireland. I don't feel any need to describe it, though. Yeah. Mm. You know, mm. that makes sense. Well, p- well, and perhaps it's through the the relationship to one's ancestors yeah, that, that yeah. this <coughs> question is kind of met out. Yeah, yeah well, mm. the metaphysical kind of um, bond link between physics and metaphysics. Mm. And, and maybe mm-hmm. it's in there somewhere. Sure. In terms of yeah, how you but describe yeah. space. Yeah. You know. But isn't that the problematic mm. thing if we mm. were to talk about that? Is where you get that sense of place because again, in that Irish narrative, which mm. I was talking about, that they wanted to is to. Press, mm. you know, to push mm. this idea that to be Irish was to be working class, to be Catholic, mm. to be working the land, or to want to be back on the land mm. if you weren't on the land, mm. and all of that. But actually, the other experience that I was talking about, say, mm. for example, the Mini Gellets, mm. the Evie mm. Holmes, that their experience mm. is not that. Yeah. And those that drove a cultural force and helped define Irish culture, which mm. I mentioned earlier as well, the, 
the Irish revival, mm. that wasn't their experience. Yeah. Instead, they created a myth of it. Yeah. It's a very yeah. different thing to actually mm. working the ground and mm. digging mm. or taking in potatoes mm. or mm. taking in cattle or milking to then actually having a notion of what that is. Mm. You see, you're, you're coming at it from a different... Do you think you're di different in that regard or did you feel that? Um, I suppose... Um, Yes and no. I mean, I, 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 I came from a particular tradition within the college. I started out in as well, you mm. know, where that was, that was also there. And, um, and I suppose I, um, I don't really know how to answer that. No, no, <laughs> just, and, and you don't. We've, we've talked about this. We've, we've yeah. actually talked about this yeah. because even traditional like names, copper, mm. you know, copper, white, yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. Not the, you know, the Ryan, the Kellys yeah. or whatever. But actually Ireland is made up and has always yeah. been up, made up of those different communities, which I think sometimes mm. isn't always looked to or yeah. discussed or yeah. understood. You know, as, and just as much a part of the question. And look, I'm Griffith, so I'm not there yeah. either. So it doesn't make any difference. But what I'm saying mm. is that there's bigger, broader stories there yeah, than trying to yeah. start to pigeonhole mm. somebody into it. Well, you know what I think is also interesting, especially with respect to abstraction, is the way in which, well, s some artists, some painters directly kind of use their personal experience as the formation of the work. Yes. And, the wor and then the work becomes kind of the translation of that experience. And then there are others with which that is not the case. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of uh, almost kind of removal of some sense of some subjectivity and an effort to kind of bring something else forward. And, and mm -hmm. I think negotiating those things, just with respect to this idea about physics, right? Mm -hmm. This analytic kind of background mm -hmm. versus something that's perhaps a bit more, you said, you know, notational even mm -hmm. with respect to abstraction. So there's, there's a conceptual framework there and also mm -hmm. a bit of an emotional mm -hmm. or intuitive kind of framework there that are both happening in terms of thinking about painting, mm. that, and, th and that's a curious kind of way of finding identity, mm. finding a language. Yeah, 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 yeah. Erin? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah um, I had, I've, I've always had, I always, certainly growing up, had a complicated relationship with the, with the Irishness, quite simply as, a, as an Irish-English, as opposed to Anglo-Irish. I grew yeah. up um, in England, of Irish father who came over at the tail end of the 50s and initially as an abbey. Um, so yes, um, that that was you know in the seventies to be growing up in the UK as with a very Irish name as the only Catholic in my class. Uh, yeah. It was it was com it was a complicated time to be Irish English, and that sort of informed my my life in a larger sense as well in terms of a lot of choices. But certainly, I grew up feeling very culturally aware of my Irish heritage, um, but also clearly feeling othered, um, whichever country I was in. Um, and I actually left at the age of 18 and went to Paris. Um, I was also very much divided between painting and writing at the time. Writing, obviously, traditionally on, on both sides, but particularly the Irish side was a much more acceptable art form and much more, mm -hmm. you know, again, we're not going to get away from Beckett and Joyce, but I very much <laughs> went to Paris on the traces of Beckett and Joyce, <laughs> expecting to become a writer. <laughs> but then found myself inevitably um, even one step removed even from, from, from my, my mother, well, mother and father, father tongue at that time, in the English language. And, and painting represented a, a more universal language. Um, I did then actually also find myself strangely, I mean, switching to art history, studying very particularly Cubism, and very quickly coming across these two women who were Mamie Jellett and Evie Hone. Mm. Um, and certainly that was a bit of a light bulb moment for me because I was very little aware of, of, of um, modernism in Ireland, certainly. But also on the other way, you know, I was being taught by Philippe Dagen, who was uh, art critic of Le Monde, who was very specialised in Cubism. He was always very snippy about the, the lack of any decent women painters mm. around that time. Um, and there was only Mary Laurence who was sleeping with a polonaire and, and yeah. you know, didn't even seem to know about these two Irish women who'd uh, showed up there. So that was certainly something that, that very much struck me. And then, um, strangely enough, my, my mentor as in painting was Michael Farrell, who was an Irish painter um, who'd, been, who'd been married to an English woman, was out in France um, for, the, for the rest of his life, died out in France. Mm. Um, but he very much, as I didn't go to art school, he became my mentor and was actually someone who very much um, encouraged me as a painter. Um, and, I mean, he didn't get a mention in your talk earlier, but he's actually one of those rare characters in, in Irish art who did have a moment of kind of quite hard edge abstraction and yes, okay. the movement of Celtic abstraction. In the, he won the Prix de Rome and came out to New York um, in, the, in the 60s, I yeah, think, and was, did, yeah. uh, 
always very frustrated at the dinner he was taking to with Warhol, where Warhol didn't open his mouth. He was waiting for him to say something of great moment all evening, yeah. but uh, <laughs> um, didn't happen. So in, in a strange way, those sort of, um, you know, bollards in my story were these kind of Irish moments that are coming back. But, but certainly, you know, again, it was, it was part of my interest when I started, Dan, Diana and I started talking, and we all started talking about this exhibition about the fact that I'd never really questioned the, the, the Irishness of, of, of my work as it stands today. And yet very quickly as we started the one or two Zoom calls we did and I started looking at all four of our work, it struck me that that question of place and recreating place and space within our work is something that, that seemed like it really was a, you know, a, th a, th a theme that was running through. And I don't know, I mean, I think, there's perhaps an Irishness to that. Certainly, I was brought up with this this thing from my father that, you know, of of, of the oppressed and the displaced. That land was all important and place yes. space were all important, and that that was something you recreated as soon as you possibly could whenever you got to where you thought you were stopping, at least for a while. But also that, as we've said before, that very kind of fantasized perhaps notion of home. There's a an old Welsh word I love that's hiraith which is the sort of sour that it's the nostalgia of of home but but a home that you are are aware might be purely projected and fantasized yes. Mm -hmm. yes and i think i was always very aware growing up between my english protestant mother and my irish catholic father in in england and looking back to ireland that i knew that i probably was having this kind of embellished you know romantic vision of ireland and i was always a bit a bit wary of that but also going back to Ireland, get scared of the kind of imposter syndrome, because there's, a, there's a really an internal sort of dichotomy, not to say kind of warring going on, you know. Um, Tallow, where my father came from, was, yeah. was, was raised to the ground by the British in, uh, um, well, that was yeah. rebuilt in tw 1923, because, uh, say, yeah, 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 the, uh, the IRA had killed yeah. a couple of soldiers and <laughs> the retribution yeah. was swift on. So it, it was, you know, it was a complicated question in terms of identity. I've certainly realised, though, that in terms of that step into abstraction was, but, but a, I hope, an, an evocative and organic abstraction, um, there's, yes, there's, there's that Celtic uh, pre-Christian... Mm. Um, visual thing that that is just that that's kind of in my dna whether i like it or not but at the same time you know um andrew and i were discussing this we're also kind of aware that it's quite universal as well in the yes. sense that there are many cultures around the world certainly pre 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 pre-writing um that were more about the curves and the organic than they were um, about the, the straight line. <laughs> or, or the figurative. It's, it's yeah, actually absolutely. absolutely embracing pure abstraction as well. Which is yes. That. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, I feel like sort of the question of today is I'm not sure how Irish my, <laughs> my work is. Mm. Or, but I certainly feel that that question of being um, all people who are you know, displaced, being part of a diaspora, um, so many strong moments in art history seem to be about cross fertilization and movements of people and people changing place and I don't know how many of those artists you know painting is a wonderful place of projection mm. and and of projection of space as well and it's you know traditionally the more traditional Irish arts that spread were kind of through the book uh, and you know the, the wonderful illuminated manuscripts but I feel that now there is perhaps that you know, physical wealth that we have that has been somewhat missing at certain times in, in Irish history. There is at least that possibility to start creating paintings in, in, in recent decades that maybe wasn't there mm. so much before. I don't know. So it's I, I find that, so it's interesting actually, you know, and listening to the way that you're describing, and I mean, we're in the Irish Arts Centre, so this is why the question is here. Um, as I said in my, my, in my talk earlier, is that I deal with uh, quite a few contemporary artists at, ho at home, if I can say it like that, in Dublin or in Ireland. And they, they're trying to, they do resist the, the title Irish. You know, some do, because they find, and also particularly if they work in abstraction or if they work in, you know, that type of work, is that they feel that that gives them the space not to be prescriptive. In other words, that abstraction should never be about nationality. That was one of the things that, that some people will argue, that it is a sort of universal language. That's the argument that even Jellet herself was saying, in a sense that, yes, that she could trace 
her Celticness and she could trace all of that. But she could also link herself, say, to a medieval religious you know, uh, imagery and those metaphysical notions of what they were looking for in art. Um, and she was saying that it's in the universality that she could, she could find her expression. And when she would do that, then it would speak to everyone. Is that, is that, does that make sense to you in, in one sense? Like, do you think that, um, like, would, if, if you weren't in the Irish Arts Centre, do you describe yourself as an Irish artist in other exhibitions or when you're presenting your work, Danielle? I'm always the first one to go here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, I think that's a really complicated, um, interesting question. I think, first of all, this happens to artists across the board. So especially to yeah. black artists, Mexican artists, yes. Latin American artists, Jew Jewish artists, right? So, um, you know, so I'm, I heard Mark Bradford speak a few years ago when he was asked that question, how do you feel about being in these shows about black artists? And mm. he said, I'm taking all the opportunities and it's my job to come into those opportunities and to disrupt those stereotypes. Exactly. And I think that, um, you know, I wouldn't disregard it. I don't mm. go around saying, you know, I'm, I'm Irish American and, you know, but no, I certainly welcomed this absolutely being in this context and I think yeah. also you know the Irish American you know America in general it's you know I grew up in a town where 50% of the surnames were Irish and the other 50 were Italian and you were Irish or you were Italian <laughs> and um, and that's you know that's just America like that identification of how that goes in that way so it, they say you know the Irish we get more Irish than the Irish they embrace it a lot more so um, but I think it's you know it just an art I think an individualistic artistic impulse to, to disrupt that and to say, oh, we don't want to be put into different categories as women artists, black artists, Irish artists, whoever way. But coming into it, it's like really just disrupting those stereotypes. And I think that, you know, talking about Irish diversity um, historically, I think is really fascinating mm. that you brought up. And I think for me, what is amazing, this is you know, connected, like, my, my family are Irish speakers, so we're always discussing the Irish family, uh, you know, the Irish language dying. And what is save, saving the Irish language is all the immigration, mostly of a lot of African refugees and immigration into Ireland who are now very patriotic and who are very fluent in Irish. That is true. And so yeah. it's this, you know, there's so that many levels of disruption of what you stereotypically think of, well, what is a woman? Mm -hmm. What is Irish? What is being black, you know, in different mm -hmm. ways. So, so. On that, what do you think? Helen? You know, when I came over to Chicago to grad school, it was there was Mary, the Mary Lovett, there was the Kerry Babies, oh, and there yeah. was something else I can't remember. And I got on that plane and thought, Jesus, I'll never go back. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. Does everybody understand the Anne Lovett story yeah, and the Kerry Babies? Um, if you it was, to actually tell the story. It was just a wicked place for women, where women yeah. were criminalized for their sexuality, or, and, and the men always got away scot-free, you know, it's, yeah. it, was, it was desperate. And I put myself as far away from Ireland as I could possibly at the Art Institute of Chicago. I lived in Wicker Park rather than go down to the south side to where there would have been an Irish community, and I wanted artists to be my country. You know, I, yeah. I wanted that country. I wanted, I wanted a new nationality of... Um, free thinkers and people outside of the Catholic Church and people outside yeah. of the kind of tyranny of nationalism. And um, I'm still there, really, you know. I'm, I'm very, you know, I live in Leitrim, I live here, yeah. but I think in fragment, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and I, um, my work is, is very much about my splintered identity as a human, you know. Yeah. And that my resistance to any notion or one description of what I am. Yeah, I think that makes sense if you look at a work like this. Yeah. These, these fractured pieces and reassemblages. Right. Of I, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it is, which is, which is fantastic. And there was this idea of just shredding nationalism, n yeah. nationalism for me, mm. you know? I just wanted to shred it. Actually, that's an interesting point then, you know, the idea of Irish but then stroke nationalism. You know, the, mm -hmm. there's a difference. You know, the oh, there is, yeah. And I think there's a difference, particularly in the, the next generation, like uh, the, the, you know, the post, what? We'd like to put ourselves in there, Diana, wouldn't we, into yeah. that other sort of post-generation mm. for those of the, that lives all the time, that there's, there's that, that change happening as well. So, to, so in terms of 
In terms of your work, Diana, in terms of this notion, I mean, the resistance of or acceptance of, are you able to explore it in your work? Um, I suppose I, you know, I obviously I live there. So I think of myself um, as, and, and I do think of myself actually as a painter, you know, as an artist who is a predominantly a painter. Yeah. And I come from Ireland and, and I, I think the more I travel and the more time I spend abroad, the more easy it is for me to say that I'm an artist from Ireland. That's interesting. You know, yeah, yeah. And I suppose, you know, everything you were talking about, Helen, I mean, that was part of the, what I meant earlier about the, the uh, uh, very early on developing a kind of way of, of thinking about visual language that sidestepped that, everything right. you were talking about. Because I all the Anne Lovett stuff, like I remember all that going into school and after that. So for people, I don't know if you know who yeah, Anne Lovett you should was. Tell yeah, so there was a 15-year-old girl who died giving birth at a grotto, a religious grotto, and nobody knew she was really pregnant, no. but she died and the baby died. And it was sort of one of those tragic, um, I was going to say horror stories from rural Ireland, but it was a story from rural Ireland, but it wasn't that probably uncommon either. It's just mm -hmm. this, um, nobody knew who the father was, nobody knew what had happened, but it was the religiosity of the era that made it so yeah. traumatic for everybody because of the overriding Catholicism and the fact that she went to a grotto rather than got sought any medical help and so there was all of these stories the carry babies was the uh, moving statues the moving statues oh, we had mass <laughs> hallucinage, hallucination hallucination <laughs> uh, you know so there was a lot of of things that were happening to and it was probably a culture in transition as well you know the I, hallucination I is a symptom of that yeah we were talking we were talking yeah. about that I think I, I do think in some ways that you have to look at it I think that's a marker mm -hmm. in Irish society there was these these events and then culminating as well with the papal visit in the late 70s mm. and also with the abortion and the, the divorce referendum mm. um, and all of that. But I think once we got over those, dare mm. I say, mm. high low points, mm. is that then what happens is, is that there's a start of questioning and pushing back. And that means that it's not just a country asking questions, mm. but it's individuals asking questions. Mm. And that's where the writers start to emerge. Mm. That's where the artists mm -hmm. start to emerge. And mm. that's where they, 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 need, they need to, you know, they need to, look at this to need to think about these questions and what does it mean to us and we actually had the courage to do so yeah I also thought it was very interesting earlier when you said about you know in terms of when you, you brought up about mm. manifestos and you know um, movements within Ireland and and you said about the art schools yeah. being the most uh, influential yes, they were. places because they really were you know and, and whoever was teaching in a particular art school would have would create the pathway yes, where there did. would be so I, I I went to a particular art college in Limerick where I was taught by people from St Martin's in London who had a slightly you know more uh, international view but it completely suited the personality type and the way I was thinking about how I was going to construct um, painting language for myself and and so so um, in terms of that there is a degree that that's something that happened in 19 early 1990s yes, Ireland in Limerick where there was a lot of people who probably did have this way of thinking about painting language and it's it is um, particularly um, that area of Ireland of that era you know, and yeah. whether they went on or not and developed it, but I did, that's the thing. So it, it does come from that. It does have its roots in a particular art school at a particular time in a particular kind of language. Um, uh, well, yeah. well, I'm always curious mm. about these kinds of things because I think, I think when we're asking these kinds of questions, like this question mm. right now is, is kind of like, well, what, what is a person or what makes up mm. a person mm. is kind mm. of also wrapped up in the question of identity yeah. or national identity. I think part of that, you know, Edward Casey, the philosopher, has talked about how he feels that identity is actually wrapped up not just in geography, but mm. then, of course, in like the material culture mm. and then the collective memory and yeah. personal memory yeah. that yeah. one has with yeah. respect to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that artists are always kind of in this mm. interesting tension mm. between wanting to be kind of part of one's community and yeah. then saying, I'm actually taking a step back yeah. from that very community and then kind of assessing it, critiquing it, mm. maybe reevaluating mm. what I even think about it. So. So it's not, it's it's actually maybe comes as no surprise that a lot of you have this kind of reaction of like, well, yes, and yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. want a little bit of it and I also want this other thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But that, you know, just to, uh, to go back to that moment where you both brought that up from two different perspectives, that is kind of a, um, a definitive moment in a particular art school with a particular language evolving. So that is, does make me Irish in that context. Mm. You know, but and I suppose the you know obviously very early on, Mamie Jellett and Evie Home were very important to me because I used to go to the National Gallery as a child and I used to be perplexed by them, and then they would never leave my head. And then as I grew as an artist and learnt more, I, I still could fit them into that narrative. 
and that language that I was interested in and I could see the roots of, of them, you know, it, it, within that. So that's my link. And I suppose, like you said, there, there's a particular cultural heritage involved with Mainly Jealous and Leave You Home yeah. that is also probably connected to me in a, in a, in a side way as well. So but I don't know if that answer your question. Yeah, but, it is, but, it, but it's mm. interesting that it's a cultural heritage that depended mm. on those women to leave Ireland in order to yeah. formulate that voice and yeah. to find their way of expressing themselves yeah. in, in art. Mm. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, so, so very often what becomes accepted as being, you know, Irish heritage or Irish, you know, Irish culture or Irish visualization, whatever that is, is often very much dependent on artists' engagement with outside, yeah. beyond the borders of mm. what we ever wear. Mm. Um, mm. I mean, you know, the, the idea of that Ireland is this little isolated rock on the edge of the Western seaboard that just kept itself to itself, mm. you know, invented Guinness mm. and that was it. Mm. It's not the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In any way, shape or form. And by the way, he's from Britain as well. But anyway, that's another story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but equally, though, when I looked at yeah. Mainly Janet, I could also see the early illuminated manuscripts, you know, because so yeah. I could see the reference points. I could, they were kind of dotted in different directions. Do you know what I find you know? interesting about that now mm. is that I think sometimes... And you can counter me on this. Uh, actually, one of my questions was going to be about audience. Mm. And, you know, are you concerned with controlling or trying to direct how your audience responds? Very often the way, and I'm sure just you'll see this as well, the way things are interpreted, the way things are post when mm. it's been made, mm. post when it's been put mm. into certain contexts, mm. and then somebody can turn around and say, well, actually, no, for example. So, for example, in the case of somebody like Sean Scully, if you know I didn't purposely put his work mm -hmm. up, but if I could have put Sean Scully up as an abstract artist to do with Ireland, and you know it's this rigid geometric painterly sort of uh, you know abstraction that he does, and then he says, but actually I'm inspired by the uh, by the Book of Kells, and everybody's going what. You know, but actually, <laughs> and then what you do is you can make the argument, you can build that, and then all of a sudden, Sean Scully is relating directly to the mm. Book of Kells. Mm. Then another day it'll be because he's related to the walls in the west of Ireland, mm. and that's what he's looking at as well. Mm. And none of this is wrong. It's mm. just sometimes we have to be careful that it isn't the driving yeah, yeah, force yeah. initially. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and in other words, that sometimes narratives and ex explanations and interpretations of course, are built in subsequently. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in, are you concerned with controlling that? Or is that anything that bothers you, Aaron? Do you ever think about that? About how, do you ever think about how people read your work? Are you, are you concerned how they read their work? Do you try and control that? Particularly in this wider I'm, context. I mean, of course I'm concerned to a certain extent. I mean, mm. I, do, I do care. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my life's work in one way or another, yeah. for better or for worse. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that. No, but at the, the same time, no. I, exactly, in critical reception. Not, be, no, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I think, I mean, there is that question of identity and there's, there's, within that, there's that as well. There's, there's the identity that, that, that you feel you have. There's also the identity that is projected upon you how other people perceive you. And certainly, I mean, with a name like Erin Lawler, I've never really been able to hide that I've got Irish yeah, origins yeah. anyway. I've probably got the most Irish name of all of us here, and despite having grown up in, um, in Essex um, <laughs> and, and then spent 26 years in Paris. So, I mean, I, I, you know, there is that question of identity that is also, you know, projected onto you. And, you know, in some ways with my name, it's like it's what it says on the tin, you know, there's, there's Irish in there somewhere. Um, but it's... Um, <laughs> For my work, I think that for me there was a really big shift. I, I, I was really painting portraits for about the first 10 years I was working. But the shift mm. into abstraction mm. was a time when I think I was really taking on board and, 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 and accepting, not just accepting, but embracing the fact that painting, as I said earlier, is a space of projection for both the artist but also for an audience. And yes. that from the moment you're putting the work out there, you are accepting that other people will bring their baggage to it. They will project upon it. They will hopefully have some kind of feeling in front of it that's not too far from what I was mm. sort of getting at, whether I, whether intentionally or you know, consciously or not, however subconsciously. But it is, I hope, a, a generous space in the terms of accepting that other people will always project. Um, but yes, I mean, these days I do tend to give titles that give some kind of clue as a way in. Yes. At the same time, I, was going to ask you all I about your titles. deliberately also give quite open titles. It's important to me that the works mm -hmm. be quite open images. I hope they're strongly evocative, but they are quite open. Mm -hmm. And the title's the same. I feel like they 
you know, they're 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 a clue, a clue, but not a. What what are these titles here, by the oh, way? Gosh. <laughs> That was naughty. I <laughs> <laughs> that first one's called Morning Glory. Oh, okay. So, no? No, no, you're right. I haven't typed that two times. No, 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 here. sorry. It's just I'm not sure if everyone's getting it. It's, oh, an, East, it's an East End expression. It's, a, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a cheeky English expression that means something, not just a flower. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know what But uh, the middle one uh, is Lady Liberty, and that was actually, yeah, it was a very much a kind of a Delacroix moment. Um, <laughs> liberty um leading the people but i it's um yeah and the other one i'm having i know it begins with an f but i'm having a sudden moment of uh, nah, nah, i'm panic, panicked but it's um yeah, don't have my panic. no um but so it'll come back to me but yes there's um as i say i think i mean they're, they're clues in yeah. that but mm -hmm. they're more about a mood usually quite a lot of the time i reference poetry and or music in my titles um which no, kind of brings me to, to want Irish. to talk, to ask, to turn the question yeah, back to other people, is that the other thing that sort of came apparent to me when we started sort of talking and about and looking at our work together was that just as Jellet and Hone had, you know, were both Orphists rather than pure analytical or even synthetic yeah, cubists, yeah, yeah. Orphism had the particularity of being that one step removed and, and being very overtly kind of influenced by music, and that actually music is something or well, the notion of sound that's something that's very important, I think, in all of our work. And, of course, leads back to the... If Irish have exported one thing well apart from literature, it's, yes. it's, music, it's yeah. music. And that I just did think it was interesting, you know, the, the fact that all of us... And I'd like, you know, all of you to perhaps say something a bit more about, about musicality in your work, mm. if you can. I work with Chanos, mm. and... Um, I took a Chanos singing lesson in Drumshambo, not because I can sing, but I just wanted to know the form of it. So I went down there and I learned that it's, it's three parts. It's story, heart, song. And if, if that measurement isn't right, and that doesn't mean to say you'll be, a, even if you get the craft down, you, won't, you mightn't be able to exhale that kind of grief that's necessary. Yeah. And so I, I loved that idea that there was um, a tradition to it. And I, I wanted that in the work. I wanted it my work to take um, the kind of unglamorous gestures of their accumulation and um, make a visual poem that could be ascribed to music or to Shanos. And that, I, that I find, do you, under, do you all know what Shanos is? It's an unaccompanied form of, of early, um, of, Irish, of Irish singing, but one that is shared across the universe. Yes. I mean, and literally across the globe in terms of this unaccompanied, sonorous, sort of deep resonating sort of sound that they have. And then sometimes in their case, they will have language, you know, there'll be words, there'll be lyrics, and there'll be, right. there'll be poet poetry to it as well, but some don't. But in the case of the Irish, they do. And it's this incredible moment when, it, when somebody belts a song out in a pub where yeah. it just become really silent. And, and the winder became important to me. Oh, the, yes. The, the idea of the person who can actually yeah, yeah. wring the grief or the story, which is nonverbal, out of somebody. And I liked its unaccompaniedness. I liked the kind of solitarity thing of it. I liked that a lot of it was female. Yes, and middle-aged, right. you kind of had to age into it. You couldn't be a 16-year-old Chano singer. No, no. You know, and, and there was something about the age of it and the, the unglamorous nature of it that just really appealed to me. And I, um, I was the most untalented person in that Chano's um, whatever a workshop in Drumshambo, and I lasted the two weeks of it, and it was, it was good. <laughs> and it, it's been with my work ever since, you know. But that's a very interesting idea, though, that the idea of Shanos and that in the Irish is that in the tradition, but it's the same in other cultures where they have this very similar tradition where it's orality, you know, that it's about the song, mm -hmm. and you cannot, the, once the time, you know, once the time has passed, then that has passed, mm -hmm. and it's actually dependent on memory and how it resonates with yeah. you. But yeah. what you're doing is making that physical, or your response to that, is, but is, it, is it like a... It, I want it to be a physical kind of relic of that. You know, yeah. just to be a tangible, a tangible shape of that. I think there was, there was... Is there uh, one here? This one was shape, no, it wasn't shape of disappointment, but that was the earlier work where I was working with the idea of the shape of disappointment. Mm -hmm. Oh. It was earlier than this, it's not here. But oh, it's not it here, came, okay. It came so into this work. It came into this work, yeah. it's here yeah. as well. Um, how much... 
What are your thoughts? Uh, on musicality. Music. <laughs> uh, yeah, musicality. Is that something? Um, because there, there, I mean, can I just say? Yeah, please. Your, I love to your work is just a wonderful sort of jazzy quality to it, the rhythm. I mean, you can't think boogie woogie and not look at your lines sure. and things like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. But yet at the same time, then you've got these wonderful little stops and these little interruptions. You've got traffic jams, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, <laughs> which are fantastic. <laughs> in terms of experimental music. Is that, is so that I, I've done a lot with experimental music. I've done a lot of collaborations with um, composers. Do you want to show me? What one, one, is there um, one just any, any of them. Any of them? Okay. You know, so I've had, um, I have a whole project called the Library of Abstract Sound where the drawings actually play themselves and they translate into music and sound. So, okay. of course, I mean, definitely jazz and um, Kandinsky and all of that is in there for sure. But it definitely also experimental scores I'm really interested in. Oh, you know, the actual sure. mark making of scoring as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's a very yeah. interesting idea. Yeah, I like the idea that they can be played. I have a long collaboration with um, an experimental composer, Matthew Evans Taylor, for the past 10 years. And he's played a number, we've performed them hmm. quite in quite a few places. So, yeah. so you perform pieces that relate to. I make the drawings and he performs them. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And then so. I love the idea then of juxtaposition that with the, the sound of a hammer on the on the metal. Yeah, it's interesting. It's definitely. It? This yeah. idea of the making because the whole thing about welding and, and all of well, that. Well there's a sound to that for sure. There is. And there's a choreography yeah. to it as well. Abs absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's and, and a long history, obviously, of abstraction and sound mm -hmm. and music mm -hmm. in general. Through a lot of places. But would you listen to other th would you listen to, can I dare ask the question, I won't say Irish art, but cultural <laughs> music, so cultural music or whatever. <laughs> We've already know. done like joy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just thinking, but do, but do you listen to music when you're working? You know, it's interesting. I go in phases of listening to music. Um, but now it's like I have people in the studio with me. And so in general, like, no, I, don't, I haven't been lately listening to me but I like the idea of collaborating where they can be played I can actually hear I could probably act out a drawing or a painting with sound oh, you know wow. at this point so I mean I could I could hear them there's a musicality in that's, them yeah that's fascinating yeah. because actually we were chatting about that last mm -hmm. night mm -hmm. Diana that's very important in your work for sure well. music yeah yeah like I I listen to a lot of music when I'm painting and often I feel like the music is has a huge part to play in how the painting works out that it affects the structure of the painting. Mm -hmm. And I kind of see them as soundscapes. Um, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I learned, I started learning to play the cello during lockdown as well. And I sort of got so far, um, it was quite a learning curve. So I kind of felt the need to sort of feel what it felt like to yeah. play the instrument as well. So so the, the sound and the frequency of the sound, it's kind of very important to me. Mm -hmm. but, so, there, but there is a rhythm, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, just in, in light of, um, well, both of our talks this morning, we were mm. talking about modernities mm. and all of the ways in which this kind of shaped a certain kind of conversation for a certain period, a certain culture. And I think sometimes about how certain abstract kinds of movements had either an idealistic kind of framework to them, yes. at other times maybe a, perhaps a political framework or social framework to them. Um, and I'm getting a kind of sense from a number of you, and I'm curious to kind of hear your thoughts, that there's something actually just kind of about um, one's personal experience that's kind of, a, in a matter of fact, kind of translation, how, how that might be received. It's not idealistic in the way that we think of Fauvists. It's not mm -hmm. futuristic in the way that the futurist thought. It's not heroic like an Abex artist, like... Mm -hmm grand, macho, swaggering kind of thing. There's, some, there's something else. And I wonder if you might all be able to describe for yourselves what you feel like that descriptor is. I, is there a descriptor, something that somehow links in for you? I think of myself as a history painter. Hmm. I work with memoir, and I think of the work as the kind of archaeology of my own making, but also the story of my own movement. So I always look at history paintings and the stories they're telling, and then mine are different kinds of history paintings that are very yeah. personalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that really resonates. Mm. I'm curious about others. I mean, I loved your talk this morning about just painting in the expanded field. And I mean, for me, it's always questioning with painting now that we're in AI and the internet and um, like 
you know, how can we shift painting? And that for me has been a lot of collaborations. It's been my collective that I've done for the past four years where I'm making paintings with someone, um, using rituals and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Or making wall installations. I've moved paintings around installations quite a lot, like every, every week, you know, things like that, so. Yeah, the place of ritual sounds like something that a number yes. of contemporary mm -hmm. artists are thinking about, and uh, it's nice to hear that come up on this panel. Um, I suppose mine, I have a whole, um, like I have a diaristic approach. I hmm. keep a lot of notebooks, and, and um, so I keep notes of lots of things that are happening, like, like uh, verbal notes as well as kind of little drawings and Sometimes those things become huge and other times they just disappear. So and I never know what's going to be important and what's not. So the framework behind a lot of the paintings is kind of a diaristic thing. Huh. Is it like it. list taking? Does it's that everything, yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Huh. So it's words. So it's often I I play with the titles and that they come into my head and I kind of like jumbling words up and they mm. kind of stay. Sometimes the word stays and it becomes the part the start of the painting. And so it's yeah, it's a lot of different things. Yeah. Hmm. Erin? Um, I'm, I'm sure the work's inadvertently diaristic. Um, mm. And at the same time, as I said earlier, I think the shift from writing to painting for me was also about shifting to the implicit rather than the explicit. Words can be painfully exact. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassingly exact. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so there is that. I mean, while, while, as I say, I hope it's a thing of generosity to leave paint as a space of projection, it's also, it's also something to hide behind. There's that mm. wonderful word screen, which is both to show and to hide. Um, of course, screens screens existed in, you know, in painting way before the, the digital we're looking at now. But I, I think really, I'm, if I'm honest, I'm... I'm an oil junkie. I, I, I just I fell in love with oil paint, and it's mm. what still leads me now. It's still what fascinates me mm. in a very sort of obsessive, you know, mm -hmm. kind of geeky. I mean, I think all painters are obsessives anyway, because we do. We go in day after day and do the same <laughs> thing again. It's the definition of <laughs> madness. <itself. laughs> but I do just love. I mean, oil paint. Everything about it is the sensuality. I mean, at, at the same time, it's something that is getting involved and letting yourself. Yeah, be as immersed in oil paint as I mm. sometimes am. It's it it's it's something that's just actually a pure joy and a pure life drive thing. You know, I have to go back to that Joan Mitchell quote about painting being the opposite of death. I think it's something mm. very fundamentally human, mark making, and you know, just uh, <laughs> get, get, getting yeah, yeah I'm, you know, life affirming and dirty with yeah. the with the with. I mean, it's you know, it's it, it's it's vibrant, colourful mud. It's 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 something very visceral and and yeah, I try not to overthink it. I think at the same time, that's why I'm you know, so grateful I ended up going the path of painting rather than writing, because as an obsessive, I think I would have driven myself completely mad, <laughs> whereas painting <laughs> does just in the making have that joy. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's about synthesis, not analysis in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, there's already so many micro decisions that we're barely aware we're making that are there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm not sure that answers the no, question. No, 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 very much. No, it yeah. does. I, I thought it was interesting what you brought up there just in, in the context of the politics and the social. Um, dare I ask, um, you'll probably hear what I'm trying to ask without saying it. Do you see your work as political? Like, what do you I, think? I think, I think, um, I mean, slightly going back to what you were saying earlier about mm. the women who sort of had nothing to lose in some ways yeah. and whatever, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's still for our generation because none of us are um, Gen Z. Um, it was it, it it was not an easy path no. going the route of, of of painting. It's it's still you know the market still, as I say, for our generation is 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 a very um, uneven playing field. It's it's not something, you know, it certainly wasn't a career path in terms. Of <laughs> <laughs> it was way easier things to do. So I mean, in many ways, it, it was sort of an act of resistance in itself to mm -hmm. be painting. Um, in a, in a sometimes a more specific political sense, but also in a in a broader humanistic sense. Um, I um, but I I do think as well there's questions of 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 community which are very important mm -hmm. to me um, and to all of us. I yeah, think yeah. Um, uh, slightly back to that. So I feel like you've kind of almost gone full circle to that question of identity and nationality mm -hmm. in the sense that I think we've all found our you know. We find our communities, mm -hmm. and they often are about um, other displaced people and other people who have uh, 
um, you know, moved moved around and, and, and chosen other paths than the most obvious. Mm -hmm. um, I think in some ways, I mean, that's where it's perhaps interesting in this Irish context because it's something, you know, we've also discussed mm -hmm. where perhaps if the has been considered to be a, a visual Irish art. It has usually been that overtly, you know, political subject matter, very figurative, yeah. very, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas obviously all of us, in some ways, by working in a more mm -hmm. abstracted way, mm -hmm. that's that's less overtly there. And yet, I think it, you know, innately, it is it is at, at, at some level for me, certainly mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Helen, do you would you consider what you do as as political? V very much so. Yes. <laughs> I, I find it an act of resistance. So it, it was. Um, I wanted to reframe what I thought painting was and mm, yeah, yeah. what I thought I was. Um, you know, going into painting, as you said, as a working class person, it was <coughs> madness. I had three career options, become a vet, become a Thatcher, or become an artist. I hate heights. <laughs> so that ruled the thatching. The thatching out. is very cool. It's very cool. <laughs> very cool. Yeah. We had the thatch. I so, um, and it always seemed, you know, all the sexism that I endured in art school and all, I didn't have a female teacher in Dublin. Mm. It was either the life model or the secretary. They were the two places you could be as a woman. And, and my class was mostly women. And, you, and yeah. it was, yeah. it, it I went to Chicago solely to study with women, which I, own, I, I mostly studied with women in Chicago. And mm. I had a group of um, women I admired and, and mentors that are still with me. So I, I see art as very much political. You know, it's... it's um, you, you mentioned the word class to me earlier. Can we yeah, say that word? Yeah, the class word. Mm. <laughs> I forgot to have a trust fund. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... To my work, when I started making that the work that was just would all come apart, and I'd use chimney sweep bits to put it together and make these big heroic paintings that I could carry in shopping bags mm -hmm. and take up as much space as I. I'd say I need a forty foot wall, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to take that space mm -hmm. with no budget and with just just. Give me two ladders and give me a cherry picker and give me that biggest wall, please, and I will tell my story. And I think that's that's when I really found my voice as a, as a painter. Yeah, I, I I find because I think this is one of the things we've been talking about, all of us, you know, here. Sorry, just you weren't at the dinner last night, and I was at the dinner. But one of the things we were ta just talking about, I have to think about the tenaciousness to do what you do. I mean. Mm -hmm. To, to take them because it's not easy. It is that sort of struggle as well. Oh my God, yeah. um, and also knowing the backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, that you come from, um, as I say, we're just that generation when there was the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. You know, my own background yeah. is, you know, uh, I'm, I've, I'm actually the first in my family to have a PhD, you know, the first mm -hmm. to do it. Um, and by the way, there's a hell of a lot of smarter people in my family than me, and they tell you very quickly. But the point, the point being is, though, it's the idea of making that happen for you. But the, yeah. the fight, we've talked about this. We've talked about the, ch the challenges of that. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that that's necessarily a bad thing, by the way. Can I just say that? I don't yeah. think that's necessarily a bad thing. And no, I'm not into my Catholic suffering. That's not that either. Yeah. But yeah. there is that point. But um, for somebody like you, do you see what you do as political as well? I mean, and... I don't, you know, given your oh, background yeah. and making the choice to do what you do. I mean, I definitely, I mean, of course, I look at the Russian constructivists and abstraction and mm -hmm. politics. And I've done a lot of, pro I did a whole abstract protest in, at the Kansas City Art Institute a few years ago. So that lineage in my work is definitely really important. And looking yeah. at, you know, bringing in community, doing a lot of wall installations. That was something I was really, you know, something I think we all struggle with is like, in a way, the market of like, you know, you're selling work and it goes to extremely affluent, yeah. uh, affluent people. And, you know, I come from obviously a very working class background. I was the first one to go to college in my, in my whole family. And, you know, sometimes I'm around extremely affluent people buying my work now. And I, I have to say, I'm still not used to that. And it's been yeah. 25 years. It's yeah. still, like, shocking to me. Um, so the idea of bringing painting, um, you know, and I, I spend a lot of time in, in Mexico. My, my husband's from Mexico. And looking at the murals and, 
you know, that really became a huge inspiration for me for the past 20 years of really like, that's why I make a lot of wall installations. It's why I moved into making wall installations to have that combination of disrupting that a little bit in some ways. It's very hard to escape that when you're in painting, you know, yeah. in a way. So it is. Oh, well, what do you, what do you think? I suppose it's, I know. you know, I'm just thinking back to coming out of NCAD, you know, in the era of postmodernism where I made work, which was very not like in that ilk at the time in Ireland. And it was very much like I was told not to do it by quite a few people and that I'd never get anywhere. So, I mean, I just continued to do what I felt was the right thing for me. And but also in terms of painting culture in Ireland as well, I just sort of felt like, you know, that which you said about taking up space as well, yeah. you know, and, and, and being in a college which was pr even though I did have female tutors, I'd Alice Maher at mm -hmm. that stage. Mm. You know, so we had a very particular narrative. But a lot of the female painters were telling me not to do it as well, that I shouldn't mm. be dealing with the patriarchal tradition. So in a way, it was very much taking a stance to do what I felt was right, if that makes sense for me. You yeah, know? It's, it, I find mm. that interesting that you're all still working in painting, because mm. in some of them, Helen, you've it's sort of explained, but the idea that you're working yeah. directly, mm. uh, you know, you're, you're following the master do you know what I mean yeah. yeah yeah but I mean it was right for me on lots of different levels and and my interpretation of that narrative is very different I think you know it's from a f female point of view and very much looking at people like Joan Mitchell as well very early on and Lee Krasner yeah you know and then obviously having contact with when I came over here to New York first with Gail Levin who knew Lee Krasner really well and you know those things were quite important to me and I went looking for them as a way of connecting myself to females who I thought had been overlooked and who were much more in the foreground now than they would have been when I was a young student. So that's kind of, I know if that doesn't know if that really answers your question, but I mean, it was no, no, very much a stance it back at, you know, when I left NCAD in 1994, it was very much frowned upon what I was doing. You know. And do you feel accepted now? Um, well, I'm an outlier in Ireland, you know, um, but I'm not outside of Ireland. I think the language make, has a broader kind of but it did feel like that for a long time, yeah. Mm. yeah. But yeah. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, I think, because um, we might be getting close to time, but, just but, but, but uh, something I've been thinking about is how um, this, this discussion, I think, does a couple of things that are really important. There's a lot of these conversations around identity, representation, inclusivity around the arts that can kind of be these like big tent conversations. Yeah. But then they can also sometimes lack a kind of discourse around them. They can yeah. kind of be like, everybody needs to make room for lots more people, yeah. which is true. And also then you need to have a larger conversation that's critical mm -hmm. around that. Yeah, yeah. And I think this panel has done a, a really interesting job of kind of illuminating some of those ways in which that can be done. So. Yeah. Kudos to all of you. Yeah, it's been it's, it's fantastic. Sorry, we're hogging. Questions, please, or comments. You'll be very, very welcome. We've got a few minutes here. If anybody has anything or comments they'd like to make or say. Yes. Um, it's to you. Oh, right, OK. Um, my question to you is, where is the dialogue? Where was the dialogue in, in our history? I mean, you have a pivotal role. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, there's uh, what, what's actually very interesting, um, and I think this is not uncommon across the discipline at the moment, is that there's an awful lot of female voices and women voices in art history now. It's pretty much actually dominates Irish um, visual culture studies as well. I'd expand it in that. So a lot of the critical writing, the critical essays, that sort of thing is actually being done by women, which means, mm. of course, we're coming at it from a different perspective and we're looking to promote and to look to engage with women in that regard. What we saw in Ireland, which was interesting, is where did things um, really start to change? That in the 1980s, there was a number of women that started to come through. The men, mm. Some of the ones that I mentioned, Marie Simmons Goodings, but then you had a new generation like um, Kathy Prendergast, um, Alice Marr, um, Dorothy, you, Dorothy, Dorothy Cross, mm. you had all of these women that started, and then yourself as well, Helen O'Leary. But I was what was happening was, number one, was that the work was starting to be purchased. So therefore, it came into national collections. That's really important. Mm -hmm. So for example, they started going into IMA with the, with the foundation of IMA, which was the Irish Museum of Modern Art in the 90s. Then there was the space to sort of collect and to create a collection that was more reflective of the previous 50 years. So that was huge. Mm -hmm. Then there was a collaborative exhibition between the National Gallery and the Douglas Hyde Gallery, which you may know, which is associated with Trinity College, where they literally had 
a history of Irish women artists. And all of a sudden, they started identifying women working from the 18th, even 18th, 19th centuries and creating their story, creating their narrative. Um, I think when that started to happen then, people realized that actually, and for those that I suppose wanted to see Ireland beyond the narratives, and let's be clear, most people if you say Irish art history, they'll go, they'll go Henry, Keating, and Yeats. They're the three males that most people just summarize it as that. But that has changed so much in the last 20, 30 years, when now, if you ask somebody to summarize Irish art history, they'll go gel it, they'll go home, because they seem to be the ones that are making the difference. But there were these pivotal moments, and really I would say it's starting from the late 80s, that's when it started to happen. I think maybe, and just because I'm a contrarian, is that I think that the dial may be turning too far in one direction simply because what we need to do is to have the conversation, what were they saying to each other? And one of the things that comes very clear in an Irish context is actually that they weren't disparate. This is the point I was making earlier, that they weren't you know, disparate in one sense. They were all still part of the same community. They were all still talking. So somebody from the Royal Hibernian Academy was, of course, was going out with, with me to know and talk to Jemaine Jellet or whatever. So there's more cross communication than actually we think. So that happened, but I mean, you're talking about the 1970s. As I said, Ireland's about 20 years behind everything else that happens with the 60s and 70s movement, which of course is, you know, that's where we started to see the change. What I do think today, though, definitely, is that if you look at current literature mm -hmm. and current engaged, current essay, but even looking at um, catalog, uh, looking at exhibition, exhibitions that are happening, women are very well represented in that now. Um, and even though, I, I wasn't gonna tell the story, but I have, I have a little story where a very well-known Irish female artist was speaking about the fact that, you know, that that she felt this was only a couple of years ago. I ran a series of seminars. Actually, I ran a series of seminars which highlighted women, the history of women in Trinity, which was open to the public. And she was talking about the fact that there was only one cake, and that men had had the whole most of the cake, mm -hmm. and that women only got ten percent of the cake. So I went down the audience and I met uh, two very well-known male painters in the audience, and I said to them, you know, thanks for coming and all the rest of it. And I said, how are you, do how are you doing? He goes, well, he says, I'm just going home to eat my effing cake. <laughs> <laughs> because he said, he, said, he said, look, he said, let's be clear. There is nothing for the arts end of, yeah. he said, you know, so part of it is, and I hate this idea that there's a kind of a, you know, that there's a conflict in yeah. that, you know? And I think that's why we need to talk about both parts of the story so that there isn't the conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think one informs the other, which is that sort of balance. I think we're actually in that moment in time where I think we need to, to look at, at that balance and not be afraid of mm -hmm. the, the arguments and the counter arguments that are gonna come out of that mm -hmm. and the difficulties that will actually come out of that. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid of it as well. Um, and it's, but yet I'm very aware, I don't know if any of you found the results of it. The referendum. Oh yeah, my God. The referendums today in Ireland, which is to remove oh, no. women from the right for the home in the constitution. Apparently, it says that women, that the state is supposed to support women to stay in the home if they wish to, to look after their children. It's in our constitution, and it looks like it didn't. It, it didn't. didn't it didn't go. She's the woman still in the in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's anyway, fine. I'm going to stay at home, and the government's going to keep me to help pay me to stay at home, keep house. You can eat that's cake. Fine. I can eat cake. That's <laughs> <laughs> so it is. Yes, you're kind. I love this. So thank you so much. Um, I've been following and reading and talking with Clodagh Finn from the Irish Examiner. Oh, yes, yes. And I just want to share her book on Through Her Eyes. Yes. She is always highlighting women from the arts. Mm -hmm. She's yes. doing excavation. She's bringing them all out from the so-called yeah. dead yeah. and the living. I love her work. Mm -hmm. And she has a new book out called The Time to Risk All about another woman. And it's it's just incredible. No, the, 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 the stories are out there. I mean, I, I'm saying this to you, and I'm after talking. I'm actually involved in a project, exactly that, which Diane had, had mentioned. It began, first of all, that my first, my first, we got funding, which was fantastic, and I have to say, from an incredible foundation, the Schooner Foundation, with Irish American background, which is supporting us, to, re to look at the re reputation of Elizabeth and Lily Yates, who were the sisters of the... Jack and William and whatever, and I got funding. And then we, we're, they're also more importantly supporting us to start looking at the more 
the women that were, weren't known at all, that were hardly known at all, who were from working class backgrounds, were working in craft and so forth as well. So we're starting to build that. So is there a need for recuperation still? Absolutely. Is there still a need for retrieval? Absolutely. There's no question about that as well. But it, but, but at the same time, as I said, try and and widen the conversation as well to see where this, you know, where they all interconnected in some way as well. But no, I know Claude is doing incredible. There are there's there's some really good work mm -hmm. being done as well. And um, Vera Ryan has done work as well. And um, Sinead um, Gleason. Gleason. Sinead Gleason as well. Yeah. She's done work in yeah. terms of the writers, but there's also Sinead McCool who yeah. did Manana Heron, which was a hundred of women to recognise what they did. It was to deal because again we, we just spoke about it. Ireland's a hundred years old again last year, so they had this part of the centenary was to look at the role of women um, as well because we know historically they were erased, uh, literally erased. Oh, the woman mm -hmm. that was you know they were literally erased from history, so they tried to deba to balance that as well. So thank you for bringing up Claudia. Yeah. Yes. Something that I had um, learned or observed, I, and I think it's based on Irish history, colonialism, culture, economics, but in the, the 19th century, many, many architects were, and I'm probably speaking male architects, yeah. were, were trained in, a lot of them were trained in England. Not very many came back and worked in Ireland. There were certainly architects in Ireland, but not yeah. that many came back. And then later on, you have Eileen Gray. Yes. She goes to Paris. She doesn't come back. No. You know, so it wasn't just um, they were so progressive that they needed to be elsewhere to be recognized, but that was maybe a little of it for Eileen, maybe not the architects, but there had to be something cultural or Economy. not receptive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Irish just leave in general, like, yeah. like across. <laughs> I like every across every which, department. Still under that, you know, same kind of banner, breaking away more of it, but yeah, it, 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 it's you know, it's it's very simple. I think to just it's you know, some ways simple mm -hmm. to say people went away and we you know the the, the, the exiles, the Beckets, the Joyces. Oh, back again. But the point <laughs> is, is that there is there is that, and there want, there were people like Eileen Gray that wanted to stay away because that you know that's. Mm -hmm. That that's where her space was. Also, I mean, we're talking actually about France here. The truth of the matter is the bigger and longer relationship between Ireland and the arts has been between Britain. And it was absolutely essential that if you were an Irish artist working in the 19th century, early 18th century, but 19th century, even in early 20th century, that you spent some time in England because London was the cultural hub of the British Empire even after independence. Mm -hmm. Like the artists like Jack Yates or any of those, what they wanted to do was show there. You know, th there, was, there was always the looking out. You know, th there always was. The, the, the chance of whether people bring back up to, to effect change, I think I was trying to say to you today, those that did try to make change or effect change, it, they were at best, is the best way to say, smothered. Do you know what I mean? That, that they just didn't have, and sometimes they didn't have that fight, but they found other ways to do it. And I said, like, you know, there was the radical theater clubs, there was wonderful little um, Gayfield Press, for example, private press movements, where there was a little sort of underbelly that was going on, but it was very discreet. Elaine Sessons has done actually some very good work on this um, as well, and um, oh, forgive me, she's going to give out to me, I can't remember her name at the moment. But there's other people who have worked to show that, that they find other ways to express themselves rather than actually on the walls of the, the galleries. And again, the other part, I think it was you that we mentioned it earlier, we were talking about how few exhibition spaces there were as well. Yes. That was... That was very difficult. If you look at it, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it wasn't. There was only really two major galleries, um, and one of them, one of them was Victor Waddington, and he was based mm -hmm. in London, and he had a branch in Dublin. And then the the, the person who changed the whole, actually the whole culture, I think, and has a huge play, it was David Hendricks. And David Hendricks was a man who set up an exhibition. And for the first time, you could actually buy a, a, a Picasso print. But that was the 1960s. Or, you know, but that there were people who did it and that. And then the other thing we haven't mentioned here, and actually is very important, and a lot of work needs to have to be done on this, is actually queer culture in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And a group of people as well that were supposedly fringe, but they made a huge contribution in bringing contemporary art to Ireland. They were to the vanguard of it many, many mm -hmm. times as well. And that is something mm -hmm. nobody has touched yet. Yeah. So that's another story that has to be told. The other but thing we haven't mentioned is free education in the late 60s. Yeah. And I think that changed the huge. face of class in Ireland Absolutely. and, and the, 
base of art and writing and mm. what have you. Absolutely. That was the other. So there are major social changes as well that change that as mm. well. Yeah, definitely. We have time for one more question, if anybody has a yes, please. I'm just looking at these three works, especially, and the other one over there, and they're all pushing the frame. Yeah. One, two, three. Um, mm -hmm. And this one, I love how this one has moved beyond the frame, not that it necessarily was, is a frame. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing in this like powerful, powerful work, um, do you see your work as going beyond the frame? I wanted a painting that could stand up by itself, just like I do. <laughs> Without... <laughs> And to reimagine my structures of support. So I, I just wanted to reimagine what my frame is. And um, I, I'm dyslexic, I'm face bind of all, everything you could imagine. I, I wanted the frame to be in the front sometimes. I wanted the frame, I, I wanted to get away from the wall. And uh, that's what I, I kind of dug my way out of the wall. <laughs> But Dan, Dan, you do the same if you're thinking about. Oh yeah, wall I'm beyond space. the frame. Yeah. yeah, I extend the paintings to the wall. Yeah, oh. but but you 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 two stay to the frame. I I do, but I also have the wall hangings as mm -hmm. well. If yeah. you go through the images, you'll see there's a. So I have because um, I'm quite interested in the immersive quality of, of that kind of work as well. So that can expand mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. the painted surface yeah. as well. So it's, it's there somewhere if you keep going. No, it's, it's keep going. It's the, the Galway one. You know, yeah. the pink, the, the ginormous piece on the wall is, isn't actually a painting. It's, it's, a, it's a... Oh, the one that... that, that was, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, because of the way I work, mm -hmm. I have a limitation of, mm -hmm. of size because there is a bodily relation. I work on the ground, which mm -hmm. completely changes the relationship. Mm -hmm. Again, it mm -hmm. becomes a ground rather than mm -hmm. a, a terrain or a ground rather than a window. But it does limit me in terms of my reach, how, how, you know, how big I can go. But in recent years, I've been working more and more multiple panels, which, I mean, that was originally, st I started doing that because I, I have an aspiration to the more immersive. And at the same time, there was obviously the practical element of being able to, to have that reach at ease. At the same time, multiplying the panels took me back to, that's, you know, often those, those decisions which are practical, then, then you realize how rich they are in other ways. It led me to, of obviously notions of art history where there are altar tables but also you know and again back to that thing of things like the book of Kells that were um you know the multiplying of pages within within a book and the way in which Irish art really was um you know bit, I mean not just Irish art but, yeah. but also Irish art was diffused in that way but there is also again the, the political is in there as as well I actually like the fact I mean again when I started painting you know Diana mentioned Joan, Joan Mitchell and Joan Mitchell was, I, I mean, I, I was in Paris by then, you know, and, and she actually died in 92, which was pretty much when I was really digging, beginning to dig into painting. And she was a huge inspiration to me just because she really was one of the only women who seemed to be working large scale oil yeah, at the okay. time in, you know, in, in France, certainly, you know, at the time, obviously it was pre-online and all the rest or just about beginning. So what I could see locally in terms of large scale um, abstract painting, she was kind of the only woman doing that, but also I you know, particularly loved the work. I thought it was extremely strong work. But I actually like the fact that my multiple panels are multiples of one more or less mm. um, human size, yeah. rather than you know, that, the, the male, the Jackson Pollock thing, which is one ever bigger. I like the sort of sense of community in my work that is there as well, that I actually feel, you know, reading a lot of Sylvia Federici recently, yeah. and there is that notion of the political within the space you take up and the way in which you do it and whether it is a sharing yes. and a community thing yeah. and a multiplicity of ones or whether it's the ever bigger ego. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes Sorry. big is good. Sometimes big is good. <laughs> and swan's good too. Listen, this has been, I have to say, it's an incredibly rewarding experience for me to be able to work with you today, to talk with you today, to share ideas that are in the space today. Um, what I would like to do, I'm, I have asked Rachel to come up and close the event here mm. because our gracious hosts here in the Irish Arts Centre, which is my first visit, but I can threaten you this will not be my last. <laughs> um, so I'd say to you, which I'm absolutely delighted with. First of all, I'd like to thank Jason very, uh, Jacob very much. Sorry, forgive me, Jacob, for your talk, uh, for your speech for your words this morning, but also the insights that you've brought. I think as, 
uh, the, dare I say the outsider in some ways with the Irish? Just maybe you know, Irish. Just, yeah, no. I don't know. Actually, that's interesting. But the actually, twenty-three I've, and me is. Me <laughs> but, I, uh, but I was thinking. What I'm thinking is, though, is that it's terribly important that your perspective was here today. It oh, really, really was. Yeah. And I have to. I have to say that. Thank you very much to Aaron, to Diana, to Helen, and to Danielle. I think you have done an incredible. You do incredible work. Sharing with, it, with this with us today has been absolutely amazing and very, very insightful. And thank you very, very much. And I'll hand you now over to Rachel. Thank you. You're